please give a warm welcome to Stuart Deschel. It's always good to have your watch here. I gave a reading at a school in uh, Tennessee a couple of years ago and put my watch down on the lectern and left it there and came back five minutes later to find my watch and it was gone. Imagine that they stole a poet's watch. <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for that beautiful introduction, Lorna. I really appreciate it very much. And I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Miles and Mimi and Susan and Jennifer and my great assistant, Bree, uh, and all of you who are here this evening. And of course, uh, Tom still looks out for me. Thank you. All right, I feel like uh, an amuse bouche here uh, with uh, this week of great readings and readers coming up. Uh, an, amuse, an amuse bouche, whoever, uh, however, who that has uh, quite a bit of seeds and pits. Uh, and so uh, be careful for your teeth. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of poems from my recent book, uh, Children with Enemies, and then read all new work tonight. Uh, since you're writing new work here, I thought I would also um, present it to you. Harmless poem. My idea behind this, if I have ideas, is, is that poets like doctors uh, should do no harm. I'm not sure what harm we're capable of doing, except to the people who love us. But um, in any case, we should do no harm. Harmless poem. Forgive the web without its spider, the house plant with few or many flowers, and the stars for hiding in the daytime. Forgive astronauts for distance and surgeons for proximity. Forgive the heart for the way it looks like something a dog eats from a pan. Forgive goat gods and wine gods and the goddess bathing in her pond. Forgive the sea for being moody, the air for its turbulence, the stomach for its vomit. Forgive the insistence of sperm, the greeting of the ovum. Forgive orgasms for their intensity and the faces they make in people's faces. Forgive the music of liars. Forgive autumn and winter and the departure of lovers and the young beautiful dead and the persistence of the old. Forgive the last tooth and hair. Lauren asked me to read uh, Standing on Z, and so I got a request and I will honor it. Uh, the title uh, of Z comes from, essentially from To the Lighthouse by uh, Virginia Woolf and Mr. Ramsey, who's trying to get beyond Q. And, um, I was thinking of what it would be like to be at Z. Standing on Z. The end of the jetty is like the end of our language. Nothing is ahead but the open sea. Who said there should not be more letters in the alphabet? The jetty would be longer if we spoke Chinese. But our characters are not as pretty, and it takes perspective to see how the M in man and the W in woman suggest the graphics of their respective anatomies. Yet in my handwriting, one looks just like the other. I am thinking of the romance of M and W by the sea. What do you think they said in the hot sand of creation? What will their last words be? Prodigal. I go back to the street I grew up on to see if the house I grew up in still stands. But new people tore down our cottage by the cold green sea and built themselves something large like a huge coconut cake on a tiny dessert plate. Not at all like our house that fit just right. My picture window faced the sea where the sun rose and I was the sun in a gold-painted room now gone. No one sought my advice or permission 
they would not have found me anyway if they tried to ask whether they could alter this crucial evidence of my past for eternity. I could say I once was a happy boy inside, but won't. I knew early the paint that lit my walls was not real gold. Inside the statue, it's a bit of a longer poem. Through the heel and ankle, I enter from the right, the way one enters a cathedral. Climbing the high stairs, I feel the pressure in my own shins, ascending the tibia to the femur, where those ahead rest on the landing at the knee. From there, I begin spiraling to the buckle, where the up and down flights meet just below the navel. Someone has opened a tavern here. A bald owner brews coffee and pours the drinks, and two pale daughters serve them on trays. They are the color white people get when living in a mine. But they are not in a mine. Fluorescent tubes light them. I ask for water, and they point at bottled water in the cooler. They are without speech. The statue is wired for electricity, but there is no plumbing inside the statue. A sign in the foyer explains all this, where a sleepy docent balances awake before a model of the statue. My mind is everywhere. I recollect the windy streets of the capital where I had been walking past the embassies just yesterday. The leaves ran ahead of us, my dog was ready to follow. Did I say it was a big dog? It dragged me by the leash into the park where the leaves assembled on the lawn, crisp as you would expect in this season. Underfoot in all directions, I remember passing through the gates. I am in the torso near the seventh rib, taking the zigzag flights underfoot through the great cavity of chest where the ribs, like sideways flying buttresses, suggest the inside of a whale's mouth. As I ascend to the clavicle, then rung by rung up a ladder, through the long noble throat to the windswept observation deck, where I gaze through the eyes, open to the elements, above the buildings and treetops. Pine or cedar mean nothing to the statue. Gold or rust, it's all the same. The statue cares nothing for the line outside the ticket counter or the mother waiting on the bench below for the boy coming down or the one selling souvenirs of the statue displayed on a table by the left foot. Before climbing the statue, I was a citizen like anyone. Everything was large to me. Then the wheel of the years rode me to this moment. I should have seen it, but I looked elsewhere. There are smaller statues in this world. You think you are an armor. Some, when you enter them, you cannot move at all. I drop a coin in the scenic viewer. Men idle outside a liquor store. Couples walk the path along the river. Smoke rises from the chimney pots of the tile-roofed houses. The uniformed driver with her empty bus checks her tires with a gauge she took from her shirt pocket. The letter carrier in his truck reads a magazine. The merchant sailors on the vessel's watch. The dock workers warehouse the cargo. The statue does not care about deeds or commerce. The statue does not see the lives in progress. If somebody harmed you, the statue would do nothing. The statue looks through and over and beyond. The statue is not aware, some call it the statue, or that its image is well known. I listen through the wire mesh of each ear while the statue hears nothing. The wind blows through its hollow brain. Even pigeons do not roost in its folds. To stand below the brow of the statue and see out its eyes is to understand what is meant by distance and be embarrassed by all personal thoughts. The statue has no self, therefore no self-pity. If I have a name, 
I cannot remember it now. Coda, broken, he saw himself at last. The Colossus, tallest wonder of the ancient world, measured 30-some meters tall over the entry to the harbor of Rhodes with both feet on a marble plinth, yet in more popular versions stood straddling the harbor, Titan god Helios, bronze guardian of Rhodes for 54 years until he bowed at the shock and broke at his knees in an earthquake. 900 camels bore his pieces away. This next poem uh, is dedicated uh, to Oksana Shako, who uh, died last summer. Maybe some of you know who Oksana Shako was. She was one of the founding members of the uh, radical arts group known as Femen, formed in the Ukraine. Uh, they just uh, did a great protest against uh, that fellow uh, when he was uh, over in Europe uh, a few months ago. I won't say his name. Um, She was also a really fine artist, uh, and if you're more interested in her, you should see the film Je suis Femme, which is uh, on, uh, find it on YouTube. By the way, uh, I had a bumper, I made a, my own bumper sticker after Charlie Hebdo, and I had it on my car, and it said Je suis Charlie on it, and um, I was parking outside the Harris Teeter supermarket in Greensboro, and this fellow walked by and he said, Jesus is Charlie? I don't get it. <laughs> and I said, you just did. <laughs> je suis Charlie, je suis femme, je suis Mohammed, je suis juif. The naked body as instrument of social justice. I am Exano Shako, yet I cannot be because I am not a young Ukrainian woman stripped to the waist with English words written in paint across my breasts, showing the populace what it otherwise wants to see, looking down a girl's blouse or on pornographic screens. I am Oksana Shako because in this life I did not mean to fit the body of an aging man born in Atlantic City, New Jersey, wearing a towel around his middle, shaving after a long shower, living on a wooded lot in North Carolina, no longer able to contain himself in the boredom that surrounds his skin. But never did I wish to be a nun or learn to paint icons or protest on the roofs of public monuments or occupy cathedrals, calling out corrupt leaders of church and state or get kidnapped by government agents who covered me in motor oil in the forest and tried to light me on fire. But I am nonetheless Oksana Shako, her naked body the instrument of social justice in underpants and a crown of thorns, eyes gazing upward, she reconstructed Jesus, inserting her own figure amid the holy iconography. I am free, she drew across the canvas of her skin. I am not Oksana Shako and cannot pretend I am half my age or stand at an easel and know that even in the dark to a blind person, I am not a good likeness of a woman. But I wanted to speak not just from myself, but from myself. I wanted to say something about July 23rd, 2018, when Oksana Shako hanged herself in her apartment. I had just left the city the day it happened, and her voice caught in my throat. This next uh, monologue, uh, you know, this is theories about, about staying in my own lane. Uh, I'm not good at that, you know. I, I always put on the turn signal a lot and uh, kind of creep across the, uh, the dividing lines uh, there. I hope this poem doesn't offend any Irish people in the audience here. Uh, I was in, um, when I was up in Boston uh, last year, I went by the building I used to live in and I thought of an alternative life for myself. 
to be one of myself again and just myself. It will be a huge disappointment in my life to be only myself in this world. It's all I've struggled against my whole life. I don't want to just be myself. You know? I'm not as large and contain multitudes, but uh, at least I wish to contain selves. An old man on the stairs. Mrs. Delaney and Mrs. Costello are as dead as their husbands in the ground decades before them. Once and again, one of the widows would invite me in for tea, if you know what I mean, which for Mrs. Delaney meant whiskey from County Antrim, and for Mrs. Costello, bone-dry Jerez sherry. Sometimes on her third whiskey, Mrs. D. would sing predictably of the blooming rose of Antrim, or Mrs. C. with her sherry play Lady of Spain on the spinet piano, Mrs. D., I would say, you have a lovely voice like the breezes themselves through the glens of County Antrim. Aren't you glad I'm not doing a brogue? And Mrs. C., your notes are struck like a Spanish dancer's feet upon an ivory stage. I was shameless then, and when their children and grandchildren visited, I could tell on the faces of the grown ones they knew what was up with me and the grands. But never did Mrs. D. say a bad word towards Mrs. C., and never the vice versa, and none of us worried about making babies. For the second uh, part of their lives, my parents lived uh, not so far from here in Fort Lauderdale, so again, it's always a pleasure to come down to uh, South Florida, and this poem fairly self-explanatory is about my mother and the uh, day that I had to take her, remove her from her apartment to another domicile, and it's called The Last Days on Ocean Lane. The accordion panels of the hurricane shutters unfold the screechy music so loud I can hear it for the first time reverberating in its rusted and sea-salted glory in the otherwise quiet chasm between condos out of season. And I believe how in all worthwhile improvisations some sections give themselves freely, while others require more effort of the artist, in this case shod foot and shoulder, where the steel rods have caught along the rails. Finally loose, the metal slips once more into its position, and in the moment I close the curtain on the sunlight and the ocean, on cue through the doorway, my mother in faded Chanel, dark glasses and pearls steps into the hallway, purse in hand, ready. I'm going to read a some poems, uh, all of them are called lines uh, about something, or concerning something, or of something. Uh, somehow, oddly, at this point in my life, I've found myself writing, I wouldn't call them nature poems, but let's call them poems about elements. And, uh, you know, some people think they're nature poems, which uh, kind of shocks me, um, since I'm not really a nature poet kind of guy. Uh, there also seems to be a lot of allusions here to uh, mountaineering, which is something that has provoked my curiosity both physically and uh, imaginatively over the last number of years since I spent some time in Switzerland. This is called Lines About Mountains. I just learned that mountains kill more people climbing down them than making their brave ascent, or that some have the oldest rocks on the earth. Small wonder they crumble into avalanche, having weathered eons to fall. Mountains must get tired with so many people climbing them and bored with the endless boot prints of alpinists in bright garb, the flagpoles jammed into crags, piton and foothold, the kick of the crampon, metal ladders across crevasse. More climbers die each summer on Mont Blanc than all the Himalayas, its peak not as perilous to summit as Everest or K2, but more frequented. I conclude that the nearest mountain is more dangerous than the distant one, just as we are more likely to die 
at the hands of someone we love. Lines about the wind. All fuss and bluster, the wind is busy. It has a long way to go across the wide seas in one long breath, clearing its throat down the avenues of commerce. The wind is master of the clouds, sends scraps and dust along the highways. The wind can be fresh and the wind can be ill. Everyone has mixed feelings about the wind. The Scirocco, the Santa Ana, and the Mistral, which sounds like mistress and minstrel, all make you crazy. You can blame the wind when you hate your job or beat your kids, go off with your colleague for a dirty weekend, but no one likes it when the wind quits and stops the chimes in the park and stalls the sailboats in the public fountains and the blades cease spinning on the prairie and gutter leaves halt running toward erosion and no breeze lifts the horse's tail or dries the sweat on a baby's neck. The letter carrier has left his little truck open. The wind is blowing away my debts. I hope. Lines about rivers than the sea. I don't like to swim in rivers. True. Their lengths and bends trouble me. If my chest touched against river weeds, I would panic. No, I don't like to swim in rivers, but I admire them for being relentless. Even blind rivers buried under cities are rivers that run just a few days a year. Some rivers create borders between states and nations. Some rivers stray from their courses or are damned from flowing to neighbors. I very much like the word estuary and the thought of boats at low tide there, and I appreciate how a river divides Pest from Buddha, Minneapolis from St. Paul, or the banks someone decided were left and right. A current is like a river in the sea. When I was small, I lived along the beach. When I got caught in a riptide, a passing wave brought me home. You know, I was thinking when I was working on this poem about Neanderthals, and then I went to an exhibit on Neanderthals, and, you know, Neanderthals really have a bad reputation, and it's really unfair if you think about it. I mean, everybody, you know, dismisses Neanderthals, but um, as this poem suggests, Neanderthals are actually capable of creating great art and beauty, and perhaps they might have been the better among us. Um, before um, the Homo sapiens uh, took over. Um, I guess we all have, as they study it, somewhere between two and six percent of Neanderthal DNA in us. Um, lines of evolutionary progress. Creatures of the earth, we gazed upon the sky. We straightened up and grew taller. No more thistles in the palm or knuckles in the dirt. We liked the taste of meat, and it made our brains and bodies strong. Some of us trapped the herds in canyons. Some of us ran them off the cliffs. Some of us drew their deeds in caves and lit our walls with rendered fat. I don't want to stand up. I want to lie here in a lawn chair and pretend I am back at the Tahiti bar in San Tropez, where rich people go naked in the sunshine. Just a little couplet here. Lines after a relationship. Then the sea closed around them as it does when nothing sails where something was. I always like to try to get a poem that's only two lines or one line into my books to see if I get away with it. Just two more. Uh, This is called The Foreigner. It is snowing in a city where it almost always snows. Under the arcades, some distant version of myself. My grandfather broke, but dressed in a modern suit. 
in a hat and long coat, holds an umbrella. A man of the early 20th century, he has not let yet learned to smile for pictures. He asks in your language if he might have one of your cigarettes, and you give him two. He wants to place the extra one you gave him in the silver case in his pocket I have kept safe. But for now, you take a cigarette yourself, and he lights it for you with a match he has kept dry in his long coat pocket. Neither of you wants to step out again in the snow. He thanks you once more, and it makes you feel good about yourself, even if you have done terrible things to others that day. And I'll conclude with lines along a wild place. I walked through the enterprise of weeds. A crow for each of us stood mounted on a fence. Sometimes I miss everyone I ever loved when their faces reflect in the hard, wide leaves of the magnolia, their names like blossoms and their lives once so real and fragrant, now like handkerchiefs beneath the trees. If my dog were alive, he might piss on them and I would have to yell at him not to, if anyone were around. If anyone were around, I would say I had momentous news to tell, but forget what it is. I will ask the dogwoods to remind me what it means to live along the edges of the woods, to be promiscuous but bear white flowers. Thank <laughs> you.